Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Erhard, um, and I'm going to talk about the monitorial citizenship. I'll define that later, um, but thinking of it as a design landscape uh, based on projects that we see, because uh, right now, armed with smartphones and the internet, people around the world are uh, taking on institutions and elites um, and racking up some victories. Uh, so we have some interesting projects. Um, such as uh, this effort a few weeks ago. You might have seen a United Airlines flight uh, where passenger David Dow uh, was dragged off of the flight um, because they needed to make room for uh, United staff to uh, get to their next location to, to start their work. Uh, by the security staff, he was knocked against the armrest and then dragged out unwilling. Um, and a lot of people recorded this. Uh, they took video, uh, photos, uh, and make quite a hubbub leading to uh, a campaign to boycott United Airlines and temporarily affecting their shareholder price, um, uh, their stock price. And not only that, but uh, the lawyer for this gentleman said that the, the increase in the value of his civil lawsuit, which will be pending, is much, much greater thanks to the efforts of these uh, uh, monitorial citizens. You might have also been aware of uh, this gentleman, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos, uh, so he was recently uh, fired from Breitbart. Uh, he lost a book deal and was disinvited from a conservative conference in the United States. And this was largely due to a Canadian teenager who was a political junkie. Uh, so she was upset with the influence that he was gaining and the fact that he was going to speak at this major political conference and said, wait a minute, I remember last summer there was a podcast where he defended uh, men sexually abusing young boys as a rite of passage. Uh, she dug this up, um, shopped it to conservative outlets that she thought would maximize the impact of this, of this and led to that outcome uh, for, for Milo. And here's a project out of the Center for Civic Media. So this is called Promise Tracker. And we've been doing work in Brazil. Um, and we've been working with uh, students in the state of Pará. And they've been doing some interesting work around defending their right to nutritious lunches, uh, which is actually a legal right, um, but was not being provided in their schools. This was an existing student movement that used our tool um, that allows people to create their own surveys, collect data, and then turn it into reports that tell a story um, to, if lunch was served, take a photo um, and note its quality. And because of the partnership between the movement and the public prosecutor, they were actually able to, to leverage this data collection effort um, to increase uh, both the provision and the quality of lunches during their campaign uh, last fall. Um, so these three cases represent kind of a growing list of campaigns and actions in which average people uh, take advantage of uh, technology um, to monitor the performance of companies, elites, um, and governments. And this is kind of a new age of monitorial citizenship, which is also coinciding with a rise of mistrust in institutions. Um, and so I want to talk about that rise of mistrust. I want to define this idea of monitorial citizenship for you and then offer some design principles about you know, folks that want to build technology on this. Um, and last but not least, I want to reflect a little on the ethics of doing all of this. Um, so let's begin with, with this kind of rise of, of mistrust. Uh, in 2012, this political commentator in the US, Christopher Hayes, wrote a book uh, called The Twilight of the Elites, in which he saw this rising mistrust of, of elites um, and said, actually, you know, this seems to be pretty broad across the electorate. And it's increasing uh, kind of the level of insurrectionist uh, momentum. These are people who believe that these institutions are fundamentally flawed and thus need to get rid of them. Uh, completely kind of sweep out the old um, and, and bring in something new or return to a previous version of that institution that they thought uh, actually worked better. Um, and so we've seen this manifest um, in insurrectionist elections uh, around the world, from Duterte um, to the Brexit vote um, to our uh, president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump. We believe that they're going to kind of come in and completely uh, revolutionize these institutions. Um, and we believe that they kind of offer this anti-institutionalist um, idea. So where does this come from? Well, we've seen mistrust um, on the decline uh, in the United States saying, you know, people do not trust the government. Um, and this continues to go down. Um, but it's not just government. It's also other institutions. It's public schools. It's banks. Um, it's the judiciary. It's the presidency. Um, and so... Uh, 
It's also important to note that this is not just the United States, right? This is around the world. And the PR consultancy Edelman in their trust barometer has been showing how uh, trust in, uh, in governments and institutions around the world continues uh, to decline. Um, media also declines. You know, this, this has this kind of traditional role of being um, the watchdog of these things. The ones in green indicate below 50% trust in these institutions. Um, and then the other folks, the civil society organizations that are also meant to be the, the stopgap, um, are also declining in trust in, in, in many countries. Um, and this is leading to this moment where actually young people who grew up in democracies are saying that that is not as important to them anymore. That they don't necessarily need a, uh, a democracy as an essential part of their experience, uh, which may be the cause for um, the cause for some of these charismatic populist leaders rising to power. Um, but that's not the only option. There's also the option of a kind of grassroots insurrectionist civics effort, um, which I call monitorial citizenship. So how do we define this? Well, one way to define this is a form of civic engagement in which people track issues or communities um, of local or personal interest and then take action when they feel uh, that they must. And I'm talking about this as a form of citizenship and not just as a tactic, because we're actually thinking about this as a primary form of activity as a citizen, that you would first and foremost be you know, checking power of these institutions um, as, as part of your kind of civic duty. Um, and what do these practices look like? Kind of are, are, they're kind of obvious, collecting information, sharing the stories and insights that are collected, coordinating with networks of other civic actors, and then pursuing accountability uh, for these institutions. This idea comes from uh, a scholar of the news, actually, Michael Shudson, um, who wrote this book on the good citizen, checking kind of how citizenship have evolved in the United States. And he noticed that the informed citizen paradigm, this idea that if people just knew enough, they would be able to vote rationally, um, they'd be able to inform policy through the new science of polling that came out in the early 20th century. Um, but Schutzen noticed that in the increasingly um, kind of proliferate uh, media available throughout the 20th century, attention became this scarcity. And how do we deal with that? We can't just rely on everybody to know everything. And so maybe if we distribute that knowledge gathering process to people, they all turn into these monitorial citizens that track things of local and personal interest. Maybe we can accomplish these same tasks. And more recent scholars from kind of the internet and media space, Ziza Papaturisi um, and my PhD advisor, Ethan Zuckerman, have been making the case um, that actually this makes so much sense given smartphones and other technologies that allow people to be more effective doing this work. It's a natural form of citizenship for the age of information. Um, and for Ethan, he thinks that this is the natural response to the age of mistrust, that the insurrectionist grassroots civic agenda will be one of monitorial citizenship. So let's say we want to take this on. We want to design tools for this. Um, uh, let's look at our three opening examples and say, what, is, what does this tell us about design? Well, um, they all involve technology that's accessible to those users. So smartphones that they're able to use to record and then upload that data later. I'm using accessible to mean both the skills as well as the access to the technology. Um, they're solving a real problem. These are things people see as like, I need to do this. Um, and, and it makes sense in terms of a theory of change. They've actually seen this be effective in the past. Um, and so they collect this information um, and then have these tools that kind of make sense to, to do that work. So let's think more abstractly about this as, as design principles. Um, one thing that we talk a lot about at the Center for Civic Media is co-design. Um, and this kind of uh, has also been described by Lauren Ellen McCann as build with, not for people. Um, and this is the idea where you actually um, kind of go beyond just normal UX research and work with the group of people that are affected by a problem to understand how they can be involved in making the solution. Um, and so you collaboratively go through that iterative design process to get to a point where the technology represents a good approach to their problem um, and makes sense for their context. And we've seen this with spin outs like Public Lab from Center for Civic Media that did their grassroots mapping project, which kind of solved the technical problem of creating aerial photography, but then worked with activists and communities to build the version of that that made sense for, for instance, um, looking at strip mining in Kentucky or documenting the effect of the BP oil spill on uh, the livelihood of fishermen. In the Promise Tracker case, we actually took our tool that allows people to create um, uh, surveys and deploy them and said, Hey, we thought it'd be great if you guys tracked the promises of politicians. 
immediately when we got there and started working with our partners, they were like, actually, that's not really what we're interested in. We don't care what they promised. Here are the real issues that we care about. And so we adjusted our practices and our design to make sense for them being able to set that agenda, create the surveys that they wanted, um, and then collect that, that data themselves. <laughs> And this comes to a point of the next design principle of we need to give users agency. Uh, Virginia, Virginia Eubanks um, calls this kind of popular technology, which is where we orient the design of these tools toward empowering people. Um, we actually think about that as the outcome of the way that they're used, such as they, uh, the folks that are using it are, are the most important design um, um, stakeholder and not the platforms themselves because often we think about how they can collect participation um, or collect data and not the people actually being able to uh, to do that well and in promise tracker um, the idea that they're able to set that agenda create their own surveys is very much this kind of popular technology approach Design principle number three uh, use facts when they will win um, so in the grassroots mapping project um, actually you can admit uh, this type of aerial photography as fact in legal proceedings. And so it was really powerful for these folks that were trying to argue for money in the BP oil spill or the Peruvian groups that were trying to stake out um, ancestral um, land uh, borders within cities. Um, they could actually bring these things in and use them in court. Uncivil Servants, a project in New York, uh, used data collection to note all of the illegally parked police cars in the city that were using bogus uh, permits. And this prompted a reaction after, after a lot of media coverage that police then started towing the other police cars and revoking those officers' uh, bogus uh, permits. And then this project from Germany, uh, Gutenplag, uh, was an effort to actually crowdsource um, the, uh, the plagiarism of a chancellor candidate, Karl Theodor Gutenberg, um, who was trying to become chancellor of Germany, had just uh, published a, a PhD, and there was a rumor that he had plagiarized it. Um, and this wiki actually documented all those things and basically tanked his political career. But what happens if facts don't actually make that difference? What if, what if the candidate we're going after is Donald Trump and now we're in the realm of alternative facts? Um, well, then it might make more sense to leverage personal stories. Um, and a good example of that is Hollaback, uh, which was an effort to collect stories about street harassment. So this is something that is not documented, but that there are not clear facts on. That to actually tell the story, you need to share this, those personal experiences that women have of being harassed on the street. And this does two things. One, it, sh it illustrates that problem. But two, it also supports their goal in this particular project um, of collective uh, and uh, peer aid. Uh, because they're actually able to share their stories, see how other people have been affected by this, and support each other in addressing these things in the future. The bottom line is you need to tell a story. And this is a design principle from the beginning. Um, Andrew, uh, Andrew Boyd in Beautiful Trouble Call um, describes this as think nerdly. Um, and I think Black Lives Matter and the complimentary project we cop watch does this extremely well. Whether it was organically determined um, or whether it was set out deliberately from the beginning. Black Lives Matter paints a picture for people of what is at stake? What is the story here? Um, and when they document police violence through their photographs, um, through the stories that are shared, the videos, um, they're actually able to show this trend over time to illustrate connecting a thing that would other be, otherwise be invisible of a systemic problem of police violence. And that tells this story every time we hear Black Lives Matter, because those videos show the police saying in their actions that, that those black people do not matter. And so we need to think about that as a design <coughs> approach from the beginning. Not to say these aren't all general civic technology design principles, which they are, um, but other general good ones uh, to follow if you're thinking about designing for this space would be appealing to personal and collective identity. Often the way that we engage in civics now is not about joining a community, but it's about a way of expressing our identity. And we need to find ways that allow us to do that. Social media is particularly good in the way that you know, activism is around, activism around hashtags or um, changing your personal profile picture actually allows this to unfold. Uh, because you're actually able to show how you identify with that thing, and in doing so, um, actually kind of create this connective framework by which action can happen. Um, and then all good civic tech projects provide feedback loops of some kind. Um, and we know from institutional projects of, of monitoring 
um, like C-Click Fix, Fix My Street, uh, DIRA in, in Kuwait, um, that you want to see whether or not the government responds. Right? That gives you a sense of the value of your participation. That's not always possible, though, especially if we're taking an insurrectionist approach and our government is not our partner. But we still need to find a way to illustrate how our contribution matters. We need to visualize how the thing that we submitted works within um, an entire story that, of other people submitting those. And that's part of that feedback loop of understanding the value of, of folks' contributions. So now I want to turn to reflecting on this as an ethical question. Um, because it's, it's an interesting problem uh, that we're dealing with here um, where monetary citizenship can get out of hand. Uh, you have situations like vigilantism, which is a natural kind of um, outcome of this, where basically it's running amok. Um, some of it is liber like literally libertarian policing of things. Um, and other times it has good in, in, uh, intentions, but that, those, are fed through, uh, those are fed through filters of implicit bias mm -hmm. or amateurism, like in the case of fine Boston bombers. When after the Boston Marathon bombings, folks on this subreddit tried to help the police actually find who the perpetrators were, uh, and they got it wrong. And when they got it wrong, the media amplified that. And all of a sudden, this innocent person was being blamed for this thing. Um, and a family who was already suffering because this person had been gone missing from their school and later, weeks later, found out uh, to, was dead, um, was harassed by the media, by people online saying that, this, that their son was a terrorist. So how do we think about um, these things as, as part of our collective values and principles? Can design fix this as a problem? I don't know. Um, Perhaps we need to think about how we organize trainings like We Cop Watch does um, in terms of kind of like the responsible use of, of documentation. Let's also talk about institutionalization. So something like Ushihidi is a tool that when it's used for kind of grassroots dem democracy um, can actually help folks, you know, have a sense of, of agency and power and voice in those, in those situations. Um, however, we have research that shows when Ushitidi is closely tied to an existing NGO or government partner that it actually reifies those power imbalances. It's those uh, civil society organizations and other actors that actually just get to use the things collected by those people and maintain their power within the system as opposed to actually making these things more democratic. Another example um, is the use of um, tools for rapid response uh, in crisis scenarios. So in this particular case in the Philippines, after Typhoon Haiyan, a bunch of aid agencies were using frontline SMS to get responses about where aid needed to shift to, reactions to the quality of that provision. And research um, has shown uh, that actually what the major use case was for these responses was proving to donors that they were doing a good job. It wasn't actually making this a more democratic and redistributive process uh, by which aid um, is applied. It was actually, once again, reifying the power structures of these aid agencies um, in problematic ways. So this is an unintended consequence, right? Um, I want to bring up the irony of I paid a bribe um, in their initial design, um, which Tiago Pajoto has actually done a good job of analyzing in 2012. Uh, so despite a formal partnership that they had with Indian authorities to kind of go after corruption, uh, uh, there was no clear way to show that they were actually addressing corruption. So you would submit your claim that you had a bribe, um, and then the idea, I guess, would be that uh, that would prompt some sort of investigation or sanction of officials. But it wasn't tracking investigations. It was tracking the number of bribe uh, stories that were submitted. And so in the end, what you saw was an opportunity, instead of addressing corruption, an opportunity to actually increase levels of public mistrust. Because now we were showing that, that there was a perceived increase in the level of cor corruption. Because now everybody's reporting these things, and it may be way more than you ever thought. Um, and that's what's being tracked by the service. So it may actually be hurting the government's effort to go after corruption because it's not kind of tracking the right thing or giving the right feedback loop about it. Um, and so this is kind of a threat for all monitorial efforts, be they grassroots or institutional. By validating a non-governmental and in many ways libertarian, albeit kind of democratic approach to collecting information and seeking accountability, we may be further eroding public trust. 
Of course, this is kind of part of the insurrectionist playbook. You know, if you want us to erode the mistrust in those institutions you want to fail, then by all means, go ahead. But, you know, kind of tearing down these institutions for when they fail us, you know, this is, we have to think about when it's rational and when it might not be. It's certainly rational and morally right in the case of uh, something like Black Lives Matter, where we need to tell the story of systematic police violence and inspire mistrust in that institution if we want to change it. But if altogether we deprive our institutions of trust, does that leave us no viable routes to recourse? Does that leave revolution? I honestly don't know what the ethical position on this conundrum is. Uh, in the same way, many of us in this community have kind of struggled in recent months with regard to, you know, should we be working on open data and participatory governance? Like, how much does that matter if there aren't going to be democracies left to implement them? I'm not saying we should lose hope, but I am saying that it is our responsibility as thoughtful actors in this space to ask these questions. Um, what does it mean to live in a democracy? What is the difference between healthy skepticism and unhealthy skepticism? Now, ideally, grassroots monitorial citizenship campaigns are limited. They achieve their objectives and, and then end. And do, we don't require a, a kind of hand on our smartphone with a finger ready to slide on the camera whenever we board a plane. Um, and yet, we must always reserve our right to, to make that recording or to research the bad behavior of influential media personalities or to secure our rights through collective action. I hope technologists and activists take these design inspirations and consider carefully their theories of change and rigorously study their impacts, both intended and unintended. Finally, I hope during our Q&A and via email or Twitter, you can tell me how I'm wrong and what I'm missing about all of this. Um, and I look forward to your thoughts. Thank you.